you, everyone. Uh, I'll, I'll start by saying this is probably going to be a pretty informal conversation. I've had the good fortune of knowing Dan for a lot of years. Uh, and so there's a, a friendly dynamic that we can talk about and uh, the industry. But first, to introduce Dan, uh, Dan has a very impressive track record and resume uh, at Goldman Sachs, Tiger Management, and then started Pantera Capital. And in 2013 was really the, the first, in my judgment, first institution to, institutional fund to set up a Bitcoin fund. In 2013, when Bitcoin is about $65 uh, per coin, and uh, that means that he's now had about an 87,000% return. And he, he told me backstage when we were talking about this that he's 9% away from calling it a 1,000x fund. So today, Pantera Capital has about $5 billion under management. They've returned billions of dollars to uh, their investors over the years, so an, an incredible success story. So uh, what I want to dive into here, uh, you know, hopefully you get the sense, Dan truly is uh, amongst the original gangster crypto guys, he's uh, the original gangster. And I remember very vividly uh, when I first got involved with crypto, Dan was organizing a conference called Pacifica, and it was a Bitcoin Pacifica. And it was to host people in the growing community, this is 2015. And I remember very vividly uh, the first time I went into this conference, I remember thinking this is a moment in Star Wars where you walk into the alien bar and people had multiple heads and I'm like, what is going on? But so I thought, uh, this is there's some photos from this in 2015 that I dug up when we were preparing for this. And some of you, well that's Dan on the left up there. Uh, Katie Hahn is sitting down there and you might recognize her because she runs one of the biggest crypto funds. Jesse Powell from Kraken and uh, some guys from Bitfury there, the, the whole crowd. But I, what I'd start, thought to start with is asking Dan, so you started organizing the, these events. Like, what, what was your goal in kind of bringing people together so early? Uh, and I, I guess two questions. One, your goal, but also, it, as we talked about backstage, more than almost anyone I know, you saw around the corner and you saw this trend coming like, talk to me about what you saw coming, what happened, and uh, what you've gotten right. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think the, the way I got my head around it is um, there are protocols that move all the rest of the information around the world called the internet. But even in the 90s, Milton Friedman said we're missing a, an e-cash system. And that's the way I view it as a way to move value without all these very expensive middlemen. Banks, credit card companies, title insurance companies, they're so, uh, remittance companies, so expensive. Uh, and so this seems like it's gonna be kind of the final piece of the protocol puzzle that is the internet. And so uh, I got excited about it. <clears throat> and it was a very fringe group back then. Uh, a lot of crazed libertarians that you know, wanted to take down the Fed and uh, very, very strident views. And I thought it'd be good to get a bunch of people in a room, it's actually my house, and just share views. And we had a very eclectic mix of people. Some incredible libertarians, um, they were so passionate about it, one of whom uh, renounced his US citizenship and left the United States. With Katie Hahn, it wasn't a VC then, she was a federal prosecutor. We had- like Prosecuting crypto companies. Yeah, prosecuting crypto companies. People that really hated the government. We had a CFTC commissioner, um, a Fed economist, you know, so I want to get all this really wild group together just to kind of further the conversation to help both sides get to know each other. And, and you know, I really do think things like that are so useful to help both sides understand where they're coming from and, you know, help kind of in, you know, make blockchain happen faster than it would have otherwise. What is it? I mean, so you obviously, I, I agree with that, by the way, bringing those groups together in those early stages, I think, helped catalyze a lot of kind of forward momentum in lots of ways. But you go back before 2015 Pacifica, and I know that, I think I joined the third one, so you'd already done it for a few years. What, what was it when you first, in 2013, set up Pantera's first Bitcoin fund? What was it that you saw that made you kind of go all in on crypto so early? Well, when you have a new technology, they, they try and use an analog to the old world, like SMTP is called electronic mail, you know? And so people call this a cryptocurrency. Some people call it a commodity. It's a payment rail. You can do um, cross-border remittance on it. 
it's really the miracle whip of finance, right? You can do so many different things and all of those businesses are so valuable that even if, you know, crypto gets just a couple percent of each of those use cases, it's gonna be incredibly valuable. And the, the total value of crypto at the time was, was minuscule. I still think it's very, very small relative to all the, the assets on earth. It's still a, a very small single digit percentage of all the assets. So I've been a macro trader my whole life and looking for very asymmetric bets, you know, where you certainly can lose some money, but if you make money, you know, the upside's much higher than the downside. And this seemed to me at the time, and it still seems to me, the most asymmetric trade I've ever seen, that it, the upside is just so much bigger, you know, than what you could lose. It's a good segue, uh, you know, as evidence that Dan was truly one of the original gangsters. Uh, on the next slide, if we could put up a screen, uh, Dan was quoted in a book called Digital Gold, which came out in 2015. And uh, as you can read up here, I'll, I'll read it. It's, he's talking about urban outfitters as a comparison that all the Bitcoins in the world were worth about the same amount as the company Urban Outfitters. I think when they dig up our society, all Planet of the Apes style in a couple of centuries, Bitcoin is probably going to have had a greater impact in the world than Urban Outfitters. We're still in the early days. Now that was 2015. Where are we now? Yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> that is still the way I look at it, that if you look at the value of both, all cryptocurrencies together, it's, you know, it's about three trillion. This has Bitcoin at, at I mean, 1.2. We, we put the next slide up actually as well. So this shows where we are today. Yeah, so you know, we're ticking them off. When, when I, I first said that it was the same value as Urban Outfitters, um, a few years ago we updated it and it was the same value as L'Oreal. And waterproof mascara is really cool, <laughs> but you know, financial inclusion for four billion people is more important. It's gone through a couple more of the bigger uh, companies out there, including <laughs> the company right below it is a very Bitcoin skeptic, uh, run by Bitcoin skeptic. And now it's the same as Meta, right? Photo sharing's really cool and all, but financial inclusion for four billion people just has to be worth more in the long run. So that's why I'm still so, have so much conviction that we're still not, you know, it's still priced very inexpensively. And so, some to remember, the internet turned 50 last year. Bitcoin's only 14 years old. Crypto, 14 years old. So we're still really early in this process. And I think, you know, the companies above it, you know, they're important, they do some cool things, but, you know, in 20 or 30 years when we look back, uh, it just seems like crypto is gonna have had a much bigger impact than the companies above it. What are the other stories uh, that Dan and I caught up about that uh, as we were talking about this, getting together for this, uh, he, he shared with me that early on he had been kind of all in on a company called BitPay. And as some of you guys know, BitPay was, or is enabling the acceptance of crypto to pay for things. And he, he shared with me a little nugget here that he had used, uh, Expedia started accepting Bitcoin early on. And there's a couple of really famous examples up here that the last one on this screen that it very famously two pizzas were bought for 10,000 Bitcoin, which today is worth $700 million. Not bad if they held on to it. But Dan shared with me, he'd spent 88 Bitcoin to uh, get a hotel room on Expedia, which uh, I'm sure you've done the math on that, but you know, it's right about half a million dollars for that uh, hotel room. How'd that yeah. feel? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that is the, that is the kind of the point that blockchain and, and Bitcoin as a proxy for our industry has on average doubled every year for 11 years that we've been doing this. So it's just a massively uh, deflationary or appreciating currency, which is totally different than paper money, which, which keeps going down. And so that is why some people will say, hey, it's not really working yet because people don't use it because people want to save it because they're going to get more assets in the future. Because the 88 Bitcoins is actually $6 million. We could have bought the hotel for the price of the room. Oh, yeah, I did the math wrong, sorry. That's, and even thinking I, about it. I missed it, a zero. At the, end of the, uh, at the end of the conference, we you know, had a poker game and you could only buy in it in Bitcoin. And everyone threw a Bitcoin in because you know, it's a couple hundred bucks at the time. The pot, you know, was $2 million in today's money. Not bad. I can't remember. Who was it that won? I forgot. Uh, oh, well, I remember Marco Contori, the, the chief legal officer who, of uh, Kraken, who was the number two guy, and won, you know, like six Bitcoin or something, which, of course, if he held on to, it would have done pretty well. You know, but one of the things I thought would be fun uh, that when Dan and I were talking about this is 
we obviously both speak publicly about what's going on in crypto, and you know, it, it, both to make fun of ourselves and what we got right and wrong and maybe what's still playing out. I thought I'd put up a few different quotes uh, and examples, both from Twitter and otherwise, that, that we have used. I'll, I'll start with this one, which is the cover of the MIT uh, blockchain. This is a tweet that Dan put out, which reads, yes, there's a ton of hype, and many hopes probably, and many hopes probably won't come to pass, but the intersection is an incredible future. Happen to be living this moment. So this Venn diagram shows a pretty small square between the hope and the hype. Where are we now? Yeah, I, I love this graphic, and I, I do think it's way bigger now that um, blockchain has so much promise that it is often overhyped, and that you know people think it'll change everything and think it'll do it overnight. It's going to change a lot of things, and it's going to take decades. But I, I think the promise is really coming. To, to, to fruition. And um, one of the examples is, you know, we have invested in a lot of things that haven't worked over the years, but we have invested in 21 things that became unicorns, which is, you know, just a crazy stat to have 21 unicorns in your portfolio. And part of that's our team does a great job, uh, but part of it is just a rising tide of, of you know, of opportunities is floating a lot of boats. All right, so uh, the, the next slide is actually, I think, making fun of me. Uh, I, I had uh, been quoted in, in an interview, but one of the things I think Dan and I probably agree on, but uh, the idea that utility ultimately would be the differentiator, and I you know, got a lot of heat because a number of years ago when there were 2,000 different cryptocurrencies, I said uh, uh, publicly that I thought 99% would go to zero. So far, I have been overwhelmingly wrong. Today, there's about 10x the number of cryptocurrencies. There's 20,000-ish. Uh, but the point I was really trying to make is, as this kind of article is pointing out, it's, I think it's a matter of time until people better understand the different use cases. There's going to be a bit of correction on the way here. A lot of players in space that don't solve a real problem are going to get washed out. We haven't really seen that happen, but I think we both agree that utility really matters. Uh, talk to maybe a little about why you think we haven't seen that. Are we going to see it? Are we right? Are we, was I right? Was I wrong? What do you think? Actually, you might have been right. Just because we have 20,000 now doesn't mean that 90% of the first 2,000 didn't go bust. Yeah, right? Yeah. Like, it really could have happened. Um, yeah, so we're, we're trying a lot of things. There's a lot of projects uh, attempting things. And some use cases have been locked in, and I think one of the hardest parts of, of this business investing is it's all going to happen sequentially and knowing which things to invest in. Like uh, retail payment, you know, for Expedia wasn't a great idea in 2013. It, it probably isn't going to be a good idea for another, you know, seven or eight years or something. So it's trying to make sure you find the use cases that are, that are working. And I think you're seeing that in your own cross-border payments, you know, huge, huge broken system. And, you know, blockchain is the solution. Yeah. It, it's interesting because I think it has been a journey to see how different use cases have evolved. And I think it took a while for people even to, you know, I think gravitate towards, okay, Bitcoin as a store of value is a great use case. And I think people, tr you know, there's still some people who want Bitcoin to, you know, solve everything in the kitchen sink. But Bitcoin as a store of value is a phenomenal, very, very, very large use case. The, the next slide is kind of a, a, is an example of where kind of gotten it wrong is, you know, this is what I would call the Bitcoin dominance factor. And what, per, <clears throat> what percentage of the total crypto market is Bitcoin versus, you know, altcoins? ETH is in green. Obviously, you can see the uh, legend up at the top there. But, you know, it's interesting to see how Bitcoin recently has been increasing its dominance factor. I remember during the altcoin kind of explosion back in you know, 2017, 2018, where it hit you know, as low of like 35%. I think this will it'd be interesting to watch play out over the years ahead, because if utility matters and if some of these chains in, in a multi-chain world that I believe in, if these different chains are solving different problems, how that continues to fragment as the market overall continues to grow. Thoughts? No, I, I agree. Obviously, uh, there were attempts to make what's now called blockchain for decades before Satoshi got it right. Satoshi put all the pieces together to, to invent the first brand of blockchain. But now there are, you know, lots of different use cases. Um, and so I do think it's going to be a, a multi-chain world. Right now, Bitcoin's being advantaged by 
kind of less regulatory uncertainty because it's been around the longest and, and there's really no promoter of it or whatever. Uh, and there's a big ETF, so that, that helps Bitcoin. But in the long run, there's you know, so many different use cases. Like the internet doesn't have one internet company, right? There's you know, dozens of really important big companies. And so there will be uh, quite a few very important blockchains. There's something you, you touched on that we're, we're going to talk more in the, kind of the, the last you know, five or ten minutes about the regulation. But if you'll put the last slide up again for a second, people forget that, uh, sorry, the chart slide, I apologize. People forget that there was a point in time uh, that XRP was actually the second most valuable digital asset. And then the SEC started, in my judgment, kind of putting their hands on the scale and saying, hey, ETH is okay, and maybe it was a security that became a non-security, but XRP, we're going to go sue Ripple. And it's interesting, these external forces, like how it has obviously impacted the market over time, and you know, we'll see how that plays out. Ho hopefully, and we'll talk more about regulation in a second, but... Uh, a, a cool uh, factoid on that, there's only been four currencies that have ever been number two. There oh, have been hundreds that have been in the top five. That, that cycles all the time. But it's XRP, Litecoin, and ETH... Mm -hmm. And there is one other that was briefly, ah, Satoshi's Vision, or one of the, the, oh, the, of the forks was fork, it yeah. for like, you know, an hour or whatever. There's only been really three currencies that have been number two. All right, so uh, we should put up the next slide. One of the things, uh, as a uh, supporter, believer, and that uh, team Dan and Pantera has really seen around corners, they put out a really good newsletter uh, on a regular basis that you can sign up for. Uh, but this kind of gets to, you know, this is, written, I guess, by the, the royal we of Pantera, not necessarily Dan specifically, but just to read what, we firmly believe that tokens will achieve real world usage. Many more projects will go live over the course of the next year. That said, we don't expect to see a significant increase in adoption until we have cheaper and easier fiat on-ramps and much more scalable underlying blockchains. As long as ETH only does 10 transactions per second, dot, dot, dot. Uh, again, kind of, where are you? Do we get this right, get this wrong, still being played out? Uh, yeah, it's still being played out. It's still clunky, right? Um, getting into and out of crypto is not easy. Uh, my mom's not going to use DeFi, right? It's just too clunky. So we're still in the early stages. But as, as Brad said, there's already 300 million people using crypto for something. A lot of people are using it just to store their wealth. 10% um, of all U.S. to Mexico remittance goes over crypto now. Um, I think you guys have publicly said that Ripple's done 70 billion of cross-border remittance flows, uh, which is awesome. There's a company called Figure that has 10 billion of mortgages on the blockchain, huge uh, real number. Uh, there's companies like Ondo that are putting treasuries on the blockchain. You know, so those real use cases are adding, you know, value for 300 million people. But I don't think it's hard to imagine a world where almost everybody with a smartphone uses blockchain in about 10 years. You know, it'll, it'll take a while, but that's still a 10x growth in the users. So one of the things that uh, I do think we can both make fun of, it, well, actually we can argue about this one as well because it depends how you define these things, but the next slide talks about NFTs. Uh, it, many people in this room, I'm sure, remember the absolute explosion in activity not that many years ago around NFTs. I had tweeted out, uh, you know, kind of, hey, maybe, <laughs> I feel like Ripple had kind of missed the first wave of NFTs, and so we were kind of trying to play catch up a little bit, and so I tweeted something out. I don't see, oh, that was in 2021. Uh, Team Pantera, you know, optimistic about NFTs. What did we get wrong about NFTs? What did we get right? Where are we? Yeah, I think there, I would say it's still very early days in what one will do with NFTs. And a lot of people think it means just the art or the collectible version. But think about it, any non-fungible thing is an NFT. So like your property title is an NFT, your identity is an NFT. So uh, the way I think about it is the, the concept of NFTs is, is orders of magnitude bigger than just art. But even on just art, I would say all new forms of art are ridiculed by the old people of society, right? Van Gogh died broke, everybody thought his art was terrible, and then later people realized his art was talented. Marcel Duchamp put a urinal on a wall in 1923, <laughs> and everyone thought that was a joke. It's traded for $150 million <laughs> since then. Jackson Pollock put some house paint on some canvas, and 
you know, that does well. So, you know, I, I'm not saying go put 100% of your net worth in, you know, an NFT, uh, but it is, it's definitely an important new form of art. Young people are growing up thinking of that as, as, as art. And as each generation grows up, you know, they adopt the, you know, kind of the media of their era, like, you know, graffiti and street art in the 80s and Andy Warhol and, you know, uh, reproductions. I think NFTs are, are, the young kids will be growing up with them and 50 years from now, everyone will think of NFTs as fine art. You know, I, this is one where I definitely think, we'll, uh, I'll say we're still seeing it play out. I, I, I think the art NFTs, because of the nature of the easiness of copying is still challenged, but I totally agree with what you're saying that it kind of depends how you define an NFT. If you limit it to art, you're like, okay, it's un unclear, but NFTs in terms of tokenization of real world assets, I think is already, and I think you, know, you had commented upstairs that there's $800 million of treasuries now on chain. And you know, I, I would bet that that'll be at least 100X in the next year or two. Uh, so I, you know, I'm a big believer in real world assets and those are effectively NFTs just by another yeah. name. So uh, it'll be fun to watch. All right, so we'll kind of wrap up with uh, regulation and, and kind of where we are, where we're going. Uh, we'll start by putting uh, this next slide. So this is something I tweeted out at the beginning of last year. Today is the first day of the 118th Congress. While prior efforts at regulatory clarity for crypto in the U.S. have stalled, I'm cautiously optimistic that 2023 is the year we'll finally see a breakthrough. A thread on why. I got that wrong. <laughs> we, st we still aren't there. Uh, you know, this is something you, you were quoted saying, regulatory clarity is the one thing nobody's expecting. There are a few ways that could happen. Moorhead said that could be the positive black swan. Is it going to happen now? Oh, it did happen. And I actually said that when I was on a panel with the former chairman of the SEC, Jay Clayton, a couple of months before the court ruling in the XRP case came out. I said that could be the surprise. That's a good surprise, right? Like that we, we would get some clarity. And uh, the, the, the other uh, very, very big and important development is in May, one of the presidential candidates went all in on being pro-crypto, spoke at a Bitcoin conference, which is absolutely wild to have a head of state speaking at a, a Bitcoin conference, and laid out a bunch of incredibly rational policies for how the United States should, should address crypto. And so that was a big change. And I think it's pretty, you know, it's pretty crafty because the majority of Americans are under 40 years old. The majority of young people love crypto and they vote, right? And there really is almost nobody out there that's a no voter on crypto. Like they don't go to the, the ballot box and, and vote against people who say something nice about crypto. So the other candidate flipped and did a policy speech a couple weeks ago, pro blockchain, got to invest in, in uh, you know, um, new technologies in the future in America, all that stuff. And so, you know, once both candidates are positive, I think we are off to the races. So I really do think it's been a long time coming and, you know, Brad and I probably both early in, in hoping it would happen uh, in the past, but with both of the, the candidates going, it's great. And the one thing to remember is every other country on earth is totally fine with crypto. <laughs> And almost every other agent, well, every other agency in the United States is totally fine with crypto. So it's really just, you know, one agency in the U.S. that's um, evolving. <laughs> I, you know, D Dan said something, not t today, but one of the things he, I remember you saying at a, a different event that I thought was actually quite prescient, which is this idea that in five years' time, we're going to look back on this era in the United States of this agency, and it, it, it'll look like a speed bump in the broader spectrum of where we are with crypto regulation. And I'll just echo something you said that I think too often, you know, and this is true at Ripple as well, as a company with most of our employees here in the United States, we're at an event in the United States, we talk a lot about U.S. regulation and there's so many countries, I, I, I'm, I'm very pleasantly reminded when I'm out on the road, I was in t Japan not that many, you know, five, six weeks ago. The reception from the regulators, the reception from elected officials, it's so positive, it's so warm. It's just really, you know, a, a small audience here in the US, which is frustrating. Which, by the way, in our, our, the last slide we'll put up, has manifested, interestingly, uh, you look at the left side of this chart and it shows, you know, the, the, how many companies in the internet space are US based and US value accretion and then the right side is kind of in the, the crypto space and 
it's kind of not surprising. You know, if we, as you and I have talked about, you know, the earliest days of the internet, the regulatory clarity was created through the 1996 Telecommunications Act. And so investors flowed in, entrepreneurs flowed in. That hasn't yet happened in the United States as it relates to crypto, hopefully soon. Uh, but you know, maybe, this, maybe this will change. I'm hopeful, and I agree it could be a black swan event. Yeah, I think so, it, and it really couldn't be more opposite that all the biggest internet companies in the free world are in the United States because of the regulatory clarity, and even the eight and a quarter percent uh, discount that Amazon got over bricks and mortar bookstores via no sales tax, right? There were a lot of advantages given to internet companies. And in our space, there was a time 95% of all blockchain trading was happening offshore of the United States in places like the Bahamas, which was not a good idea. <laughs> and 93% um, of the market cap of protocols is headquartered outside the United States. And the one we're here to celebrate is in the United States and getting hassled, right? <laughs> For sure getting hassled. So, you know, I, I think we'll, we'll conclude on some of this. I, I think, uh, as I said up front, I think Dan was one of the earliest best thinkers about crypto and has remained that. And I think because of your kind of uh, your tenure, I'm not trying to say you're not old, but because of your tenure, having seen lots of stuff, I think when we were prepping for this, we talked about the, the parallels to the Internet. And to your point, the Internet's 50 years old. Uh, crypto is, you know, about 14 years old. Uh, and I think it's going to be uh, pretty fascinating to see as some of the things we maybe got wrong that we showed, maybe we didn't get them wrong, maybe we're just early. And uh, we, will, we will reconvene in future years and we'll invite Dan back to see where we stand on that. But Dan, thank you very much and I uh, appreciate you being here. Hey, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, look, uh, truly, uh, I think Dan is one of the smartest minds out there on this stuff. So thank you, Dan. Uh, I also just take a moment to wrap things up. Thank you to all the speakers from this week. Uh, thank you to all of you. Look, this is our eighth swell. You all have been, many of you have been to a number of them. And thank you for being here on this journey with us. Uh, some of you I know are new to working with Ripple. Some of you are longstanding partners but we couldn't make it through this with you, without you, and you've been with us through thick and thin. So as, as Monica shared yesterday, you know, Ripple really is, I believe, in an incredible position as we look out over the next several years. And I mean that from our product strategy that you saw more, learned more about today, but also in terms of our uh, likelihood of prevailing here in the United States with some regulatory clarity. The SEC obviously has continued to drag out uh, the lawsuit very frustratingly, but it doesn't change the fact that today XRP is one of only two digital assets with regulatory clarity, that XRP is not a security. <laughs> I, I will say that is something we're very proud of, obviously. We, we decided to fight, fight the fight and uh, very pleased with Despite the frustration that it continues, uh, very pleased we decided to go that path. So from, as we reflect on the last couple of days, from, from some of the great new features that we've announced around Ripple custody to what we've shared in our launch plans with RL Ripple USD, RL USD, exchange partners, even to the launch of Ripple payments in Brazil with Mercado Bitcoin as the first customer to utilize Ripple's end-to-end -end payment solution. I really am, as I kind of wrap things up, feeling emboldened by the support, by the community. And as I was being interviewed yesterday, and uh, somebody asked me, like, well, how do you feel about the XRP army? And they kind of said, they referred to it as the XRP family. And I said, I'm going with that. It's the XRP family, because I view so many people who are our family uh, and have been with us on this journey for a while. So thank you. Uh, the energy on the ground over the last couple of days has been amazing. Uh, please take a moment, you've probably met new people, take a moment, exchange contact information. We want this to be an event where people come together, not just to work with Ripple, but to work with each other. Uh, let's keep the conversation going. Let's not stop innovating. Thank you to all of you, and thank you to the incredible Ripple team that brought this event to life. Uh, it truly has been a magical couple of days. So thank you very much. As said, there's a happy hour across the street, so thank you, join us.